Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will discuss mineral management. Micronutrients encompass macro minerals, trace minerals, and vitamins in the feeding program. They're a bit unique compared to other nutrients because first, we add them in very small amounts, typically grams or milligrams per day, where other nutrients are added in kilogram levels. Second of all, most farmers and nutritionists do not routinely analyze these in testing labs because of expense. Next, these nutrients are relatively quite expensive in terms of the amount you get for the dollars paid compared to such things as protein or energy. And finally, there is no immediate milk response when fed in a balanced ration, which means it may take six months to a year before you can really say, yes, this has been a good improvement. Factors to consider when adding micronutrients to the ration will include such things as their relationship to milk production. Key examples as cows give more milk, Calcium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium levels go up because they're secreted in the milk. The cow exports them out. Next, we know that gestation certainly has an important role in mineral needs as we have an, another body, in this case an unborn calf, being formed inside the dairy cow and may even be two calves if we have twins. Next, we know ration costs will vary as low as 15 cents per cow per day to as high as 50 cents per day, depending on the level of mineral and the form of mineral we're going to feed. And finally, we know that the impact of stage of lactation is going to be important in terms of how much of these micronutrients we will be adding. When looking at micronutrients, four key factors will come into play. One, its availability. Two, its balance. Third, the requirements the cow have. And fourthly, the economics of these micronutrients. When looking at availability, certainly the question is where are they located? This data from Washington State illustrates that some minerals are tied very closely to the NDF fraction. This would be the fiber, which would have lower digestibility. So you can see, for example, in alfalfa, 84% of the iron in these studies was associated with the NDF fraction, probably certainly reducing availability. Compare that to potassium in alfalfa, only 2%. And we know that potassium is quite an available mineral in the feeding program. So certainly this will vary from crop to crop and certainly will have an impact in terms of how much we need to supplement and how much is biological available to the dairy animal. Certainly another key factor will be the level that's in the ration. Here is some work done by Larry Berger here at the University pulled together looking at alfalfa mineral values. We have listed four minerals on the left side. Then we look what is the average concentration expressed as parts per million. Next, we go across to the ratio. In other words, saying what is the level in the feed compared to what the NRC is recommending. And then the standard deviation simply is the statistical analysis that says plus or minus this value will include two-thirds of the value of that feed stuff. So let's go down to iron. We'll start with iron and just walk you through. The average for alfalfa, it would be 159 parts per million. This represents almost a total requirement of the animal. But look at the standard deviation. It says iron will vary almost as much as the average. And that's what makes this very tricky when building rations. While iron is not a key one, let's go down to copper. And you'll notice that the standard deviation is actually larger than the base number, which means on average, copper and alfalfa will go all the way from zero we can't go negative, to as high as probably 10 or 12 parts per million. This PowerPoint now illustrates corn silage. And the same variation is obvious in corn silage we saw with alfalfa. You can digest these as you wish or print them out. But again, you can see the numbers are lower and have the same variation we saw with alfalfa. And that's what makes some of the supplementation programs a bit tricky with minerals is because of this wide variation depending on where you live and the type of crops you're feeding to the livestock. Another important aspect is balance, the relationship of one mineral to another. These are some ratios that you can find in the NRC, in the literature, or out in the field. And what it simply reads is, as you are feeding copper for each one part of zinc, and that's probably expressed as milligrams, you need one part of copper. That's a four to one ratio. If this ratio gets down to a much wider ratio or narrower ratio, it may affect the availability of the other mineral. A classic one is further down, 
copper moly or molybdenum and that is six to one so it says if you live in certain parts of the western u.s which is high in moly then as moly levels go up you have to feed more copper because it ties up the availability of the copper the last one is nitrogen to sulfur this simply is for rumen microbes in the bacteria in the rumen to build the amino acid methionine and the other sulfur containing amino acids Really neat ratios. Potassium magnesium, the fourth one down, has got grass tetany written all over it. Potassium sodium related to heat stress. So these are very interesting ratios to look at. Not only do you have enough level in the ration, but do you have an optimal balance for those minerals as well. Now let's look at some basics on micronutrients. In terms of testing minerals in a forage testing or feed testing program, on forages, we'd recommend yearly you check for trace minerals, copper, zinc, iron, and manganese, just to give you a baseline to compare from year to year. However, I would recommend on a quarterly basis checking calcium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, because they are more important in terms of milk production and animal requirements. If you are going to be using inorganic sources, such as zinc, chloride, for example. The most common ones will be sulfates, which are considered the gold standard as far as availability, carbonates, and nitrates, very good sources of organic, inorganic, trace mineral, and mineral sources. Oxides generally are less available except for magnesium, for example. If we look at recommended organic sources, then we'd be looking at zinc, copper, and selenium as commonly recommended sources to supplement the inorganic levels in the dairy ration. Another important question will be delivery system. And there are a couple different ways to do that. First of all, we can top dress the mineral, which means we literally put it onto each individual cow. This works out very nicely for dry cows and fresh cows as their mineral and micronutrient requirements vary a great deal based on days to calving and days after calving and their challenges of health during the transition period. Another most common way is to actually have it fed in the total mix ration or the TMR. So we mix it in the feed and say, we think we know what the cow needs. We add whatever she has to have. One thumb rule is to add about 10% above the requirement. So if you have a certain requirement for 80 pounds of milk, we will add it slightly higher for those cows that eat that eat, don't eat as much dry matter or those cows that may have a slightly higher requirement because of a higher milk production or don't have quite the same ability to absorb the mineral. Second of all, I would like to have this at least in a one to two pound carrier feed. So my TMR mixer unit has a better chance to uniformly spread it through the entire batch of feed. A third system is free choice, which means the cow goes out and consumes it from a separate mineral source. The three most common ones would be salt, which a cow has a true ability to crave for. Therefore, we recommend to have some source either as a block or, or loose trace mineral salt or salt in front of the cow. Bentonite is a clay mineral. It will swell up in the cow's rumen, reduce the soil consumption, and may have some benefits in terms of times when there is mold or aflatoxin in the feeding program. The third one is sodium bicarb, which is, of course, a rumen buffer, which may stabilize the pH in the rumen. Some farmers report high intakes of sodium bicarb, over one-tenth of a pound per cow per day, as an indication of cows have a somewhat upset rumen itself. There is no research to back this out. There is a fourth delivery system, which is fairly uncommon, and that is to inject it into the cow. We don't see a lot of that in the U.S. at this point. And actually, a fifth one for beef cattle, not very common in dairy cattle, is to put it in the water. So those are other systems that are not very common on dairy farms. So let's summarize this module with our several take-home messages. First of all, we should be aware of mineral variation should be considered when building the rations, especially on the macro-mineral levels. Second of all, we need to adjust minerals for availability and balance. The ratios work very nicely here. Thirdly, mineral delivery systems and vitamin systems can vary, but normally a force feeding system is the most optimal way to go. And fourthly, organic minerals are recommended for dry and transition cows and when cows are under stress. Well, that completes this module. Thanks. Have a great day.